Welcome to the Milk Bottle Labs Shopify e-commerce podcast brought to you by Milk Bottle Labs, officially Ireland's top rated Shopify experts. Milk Bottle Labs are loved by Shopify store owners around the world and host the fastest growing Shopify meetup quarterly in Ireland's capital, Dublin. This podcast is supported by Rare.io. Rare helps Shopify store owners increase your sales with smart and personalized email marketing. Thanks for listening. Now over to your host, Keith Matthews. Hi, welcome to episode four of the Milk Bottle Shopify e-commerce podcast. Today, we're joined by Eddie Pinar, a very well-known founder of Woo Teams and WooCommerce. Eddie is now the founder of Conversio a wonderful email marketing platform that helps Shopify store owners supercharge their email activity. Today we'll discuss how store owners can gain the benefit of joining email sequences, the benefits of managing your email activity on a single dashboard, and we'll also discuss some low-hanging fruit that's available to most store owners. So, AD, thanks very much for, for joining us and, and welcome to the Mill Bottle Shopify e-commerce podcast. Where are you? Where are you calling from? I am down south in Cape Town, South Africa. So, is it correct to assume then that you're in the spring, heading for the heading for the summer? Yeah, we've we've just had our first uh, first couple of forty degree plus Celsius, forty degree Celsius plus days um, in the last week. So, we're we're very much into the midst of our summer now. Great, uh, AD, it's uh, I'm delighted to have you. The primary reason why I'm so happy is because I've personally been using your app since about 2014 when you initially uh, started, when you launched the Receiptful app, which I, I always thought was one of the cleverest apps in the Shopify store, which, which simply added a, a, an attractive receipt to replace the standard Shopify receipt. But before you before you uh, set up Receiptful, you, had a, you were working with, a, would you call it a competitor platform? Oh well, um, I, I guess so. I, I guess so. Yes. Um, I mean, I've, I've definitely kind of, um, you know, de- defected um, slightly since. So um, yeah, I mean, we like I, I had my starts online at least uh, way back in, in 2007 uh, when I built one of the first uh, at that stage kind of commercial um, WordPress themes or paid premium was what we called at the time WordPress themes, um, and that kind of led to. The founding of of, of with teams along with my, my co-founders Magnus and Mark, um, and I think it was in about kind of 2011 um, where we started working with two very clever guys, um, Jay um, and Mike, who kind of helped us build WooCommerce. Um, and kind of very soon, I, I can't remember the exact stats, but I think it was like within about a year of uh, building WooCommerce, um, it completely changed our business. It literally became 90 percent of our revenue. Um, so completely shifted the business. Um, I left kind of with teams with commerce um, in, in 2013. And as you mentioned, I kind of started working on, on Receiptful um, and launched it at the end of 2014. So we're about four years old um, you know, today. So yeah, I mean, in, in, in that sense, um, we're kind of, kind of, oh, Conver- you know, kind of, Convergio is, uh, is built on both you know, WooCommerce and Shopify, um, but we mostly kind of operate within the Shopify ecosystem today. So there is there is some comparison or competition between the two platforms there. So w- would you say then you cut your teeth at e-commerce with with, with on on the WordPress platform with Woo Teams, and you brought you brought your experience over to Shopify? Would that would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, I, I totally think so. I mean, especially considering that WooCommerce as a, as a platform itself. Um, was free, right? I mean, you could install the the basic functionality um, for free, and the and the business model was built around selling um, what in the Shopify ecosystem called apps or um, additional kind of you know extensions or add-ons, as we called it uh, within the WooCommerce ecosystem. Um, so I learned a lot there in terms of building those additional things that specific merchants kind of might need. Uh, so I took, definitely took a lot of that kind of learning into the initial build um, and founding of Receiptful. And I would like to think that it's kind of helped me along the way um, as we've kind of matured Receiptful um, into Convergio and as a product today. You know, we're we're a Shopify-only house, Adi, and we only, I suppose, socialize with Shopify developers, Shop, Shopify merchants. I, you know, and the, 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 the Shopify platform, you know, they, they've, I think, 700,000 stores under their belt at the moment. But is WordPress... Is it still a strong e-commerce platform worldwide? Is it still growing? 
or is it just is it has, has a flat line and is it is it being beaten by competitors or is that just a perception? So I think I think there is a very mainstream perception out here that is that kind of um, the Shopify is the bigger, better, whatever kind of platform compared to, to WooCommerce. Um, and I, I would say kind of the disclaimer here should be at least that, you know, I, I'm not an expert, so I, I don't have kind of stats. But the reason I say that that perception is there is I think, you know, once Shopify IPOs, it puts them in kind of a very kind of public spotlight, right? Whereas kind of Book, you know, WooCommerce, WordPress, and Automatic, the parent company, they don't have that similar kind of scrutiny and thus publicity, right? both good and bad, just yet. So that, that's the one part there. I think the other part that we need to consider is um, with WooCommerce at least being a downloaded, um, you know, kind of a product, it's very hard to get actual kind of your numbers uh, in terms of kind of active stores who's using it, whereas Shopify being hosted platform, that data is consolidated. So my, my gut feel in answering your question, Keith, is saying that, you know what, WordPress first and foremost is definitely the kind of the, the most widely used platform or piece of software, um, you know, on the internet. I mean, I think the last stats show that kind of Google, uh, like something like 33, 34% of all pages indexed by Google runs WordPress, right? So that's the extent um, of, of WordPress. So WooCommerce obviously is a subsection of that. But I think as long as WordPress continues to grow and continues to be this kind of cornerstone, um, you know, of kind of online experiences, like WooCommerce will still be a significant platform. Uh, and I actually, if like if you ask me, um, you know, kind of make a bet in terms of what e-commerce the future would look like, I would pretty much say I still believe kind of five, ten years down the line, both WooCommerce and Shopify will coexist because um, I think they are slightly different things for slightly different kind of people depending on your workflow or your exact skills. So I definitely see those two yeah. kind of you know or continuously competing um, you know in the near and kind of you know, medium longer term future. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And, and there's a customer for every platform. I mean Squarespace is gaining traction as well. So you know there's there's room for there's room for multiple platforms in the market. So so roll on 2014 you came up with the idea of Receiptful, a uh, very simple app. Um, I always liked the, the actual dashboard and the, the, the you know, I, I always thought that whoever designed the actual UX on the inside had put a lot of thought into it. Was your, was that a smooth transition into the Shopify world? Did it take off quickly? Was it slower than you thought? Or, you know, what was your experience, I suppose, mo- moving over to the Shopify ecosystem and selling an app on the Shopify app store? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think the context that I can share firstly. So we literally released Receiptful first version with only WooCommerce integration um, in the first couple of days of November. And um, we kind of almost by chance got into kind of our Shopify integration about a month after that. And very kind of shortly after getting into the app store, um, and I think at that stage, I mean, I, I, I have no kind of stats to to kind of compare the size of the app store to what it is today, but it obviously wasn't as big and congested uh, as it is today. And I think the kind of what happened back then was it was easier for a new app on the app store to get some initial traction. Um, and very quickly kind of after that um, initial kind of release on Shopify, we started seeing traction within the product as well. Um, so much so that today as context here, um, our kind of Shopify user base is significantly larger than our WooCommerce user base, right? So I think what has been great, um, and which also kind of proves what is harder today, but as an app kind of partner within Shopify's ecosystem, back then it was the App Store was a great way to get the app out there. If you got the installs and you mostly had happy customers, i.e., they did an uninstall the app, um, and you could get a couple of reviews um, you know, out of some of your customers or users, uh, then you were going to rank pretty well. So for the longest time, I think within the first kind of 12 to 18 months since that release, we were regularly um, kind of within the top three kind of apps on the App Store um, because it wasn't as it just wasn't as competitive. Uh, and that definitely kind of helped us a lot in those early stages. I mean, we found a lot of you know, good initial kind of traction, 
um, not just in terms of kind of our user and revenue growth, but also kind of the, the critical mass that got us in terms of the feedback, and, you know, to help us shape what the roadmap, you know, should should look like. Um, yeah. So, so, so that, that, yeah, go for it. I think at that time there was probably less than a thousand apps in the app store. Yeah. So that's a, that, that's actually a good point. It was a less crowded market. So, um, and it, it was, I think the app store has actually been updated twice, uh, since, since that obviously the, 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 the latest update c- came out there a couple of months ago. So did you, did you, did you engage in any other marketing bes- or did you just depend completely on the app store for, for downloads? Did you have a, you know, did you ha- have any other base that you could target or was it just purely a, a Shopify d- hoping that people would search within the Shopify app store? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, to this day, um, the predominant kind of channels for us to uh, kind of in finding our customers have been the various app stores. So Shopify app store, we are listed on WooCars.com. Um, and the other integration we have is for big commerce. So we're, we're listed in their app store as well. And those kind of the app stores have been the primary channel um, of growth for us. We've also done many kind of other marketing things, um, you know, some paid ads, uh, some content marketing, um, did, our, yeah. did our own podcast, et cetera, et cetera. Very few of those things, unfortunately, um, you know, to this day, uh, moved the, the needle significantly for us. And like, I don't think we, we've been great at finding um, a scalable and repeatable kind of approach to marketing, except for kind of the brand that we built, the reputation we have out there, and the distribution that we get via the various app stores. Yeah, it's it's hard too, Adi, because the, the 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 goalposts are changing. You know, Google makes a change, and then you know Google might prefer video one year and 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 you know original content the next. So that is difficult. I suppose you have to just try everything to try and make it work. Yeah. So back over to Conversio, you 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 you, you rebranded Receiptful into Conversio, and the feature set on Conversio for, for for all of the merchants that we use it with is is just great value for money. So you've got receipts, abandoned carts. You've got um, follow-ups, you added newsletters recently, you've got automatic segmentation of your subscribers, you've got a search facility, you've got a recommendations engine. The, 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 the level of functionality, is it, it really does superpower the, the, the merchant's Shopify store in a box, okay? So I'm fascinated by how people use them together. And I know that this is absolutely, you know, your, it's your domain. So can you just give us, just give the listeners a, a feel as to why you bundle them all together and the benefit that the customers can get when they use them correctly all together. Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing I have to say, um, you, you're lucky with, um, with all of the customers that uh, you're using Convergio on. Uh, and I guess it's, it's, it's a good reward for having supported us for, for so long. So we have at least since um, the last kind of year, four or five months, we have stopped uh, making our recommendation widgets on site uh, and the search functionality available to, to, to customers, to new customers at least, because um, we were just too thin to kind of stretch and wanted to kind of really narrow, narrow down the product. So today we, we mostly focus on two areas of the product, which is kind of email marketing automation. So as you said, receipts, abandoned cards, um, all kind of, you know, kind of follow up or life cycle, you know, emails. Um, along with newsletters, and then the other part of our product is all around, um, you know, kind of product reviews and ratings for user-generated content, right? Um, and just to kind of you know take a step back, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to jump into some concrete examples of where kind of how, why we or how people use those two things together. But the theory behind this, at least, I think, is kind of, there's three things that that always stand out for me. The first is if you're using a single kind of provider for, for multiple things, there are generally cost efficiencies to kind of to, to, to gain from it. So um, I do think what we often see for, for customers that switch to Conversia, they can kill a bunch of other apps that they've been using and they can actually save money, you know, through that. Um, and the math is simple there because we our kind of customer acquisition cost is lower, which means we can offer something, you know, for, for you know for cheaper. Um, or relatively cheaper. So there's some economies of scale there. The the second part is is all about the merchant itself, and it's about having a single dashboard from which to do multiple things. So I think in terms of workflow, it just becomes easier. You like you become an expert in a single like user interface, um, and can do multiple things um, at the same time without having to either do kind of some kind of context switching or even very specific like tab switching. Right. Um, so I think there's that convenience. 
And then the third thing, and this gets into kind of practically the how to kind of use, use these things is having multiple tools in the same dashboard literally means the data stored in the same database. And that sounds very trivial, but what that means is it is beyond what you can achieve with kind of even the, the deepest, most native integrations of different apps, right? You literally have all the data there. So finding those kind of overlaps between different tools or different data sets um, to do certain things is just super easy, right? The, the best example I have is if you consider product review um, and can kind of just product rate it, right? So say, for example, you had like for, for conversion use release, you know that product A has 50 kind of reviews and the average rating is kind of a star rating is, is 4.8. That now suddenly becomes very, very easy for us to kind of use that data point in any email that references kind of product A, right? It's not complicated, kind of, you know, but technically it's not hard to do on our side um, and it's super easy for the merchant to do because all of the data is just there. So that's kind of, those are the three, at least theoretical kind of, you know, reasons and motivations for us to try and bundle more of these tools into a single solution versus kind of promoting the idea of, you know, kind of splitting them out um, and using individual solutions for, for individual kind of tactics or campaigns. What you've done is you've done exactly what Shopify has done. I mean, Shopify provides the user with a single dashboard of their traffic, of their orders, the top 10, the top selling products. So, and, and again, you know, whoever has like, hat, you know, hats off to your UX team, because just as you've described it, that's exactly what you've produced. And it, it's also much easier to go into a single dashboard every day and then go into your Shopify dashboard and maybe one or two other dashboards rather than, you know, clicking into five or six different tabs uh, to, to try and stitch together uh, the same information. And um, so, you know, it's, you've obviously thought it, you know, thought it through well, well in advance of actually, actually producing it. Well done on that. You know, if I look at all of the features on the app, is there any one particular feature that customers get most benefit from or is, or is that, impossible to answer. I mean, obviously everybody gets different benefits depending on their demographic, depending on their scale of business. But I mean, we see, we see a lot of success, for example, from a simple abandoned car team. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess the, the most accurate answer is that, you know, it, it really depends. Um, I mean, my, my gut feel is that the kind of merchants that get most value from kind of the product are merchants that have more than one thing set up. Um, and kind of linked to each other in some kind of you know, thought out way, right? So I think that's that's probably the most accurate answer. We still see kind of there are what I would term kind of low hanging fruits. So um, you know, kind of a, a good abandoned cart um, in email sequence, as an example, um, is one of those lower hanging fruits, right? Because I mean, there is a lot of purchasing intent there um, already. So they are kind of figuring out how to build an email sequence to at least convert some of that. Is, is not the hardest thing to do. Um, we still see very high engagement um, and conversion rates on the email receipts. Um, so, and that again is, is, is very simple um, where you're just including some, you know, a discount for future usage and some you know, product recommendations. So, so that still kind of, you know, works really well. And I guess, like I, I would almost kind of say um, what we're seeing now is in terms of maybe not a specific tool that creates a lot of value, but a specific kind of tactic at least is to specifically try and get kind of uh, product reviews and rating data into as many of your emails as possible. So we've definitely seen that in, in multiple ways where if a merchant starts including that, that as a data point, that kind of social proof in emails, that there is kind of your know, bumps at, at, and lifts in you know the, the metrics for those email campaigns that have not been using those things before. Like your, your, your standard reviews email goes out at a certain date and then a reminder email goes out at a certain date. Are you, are you suggesting that reviews should be included in other email sequences besides just the standard two, two email setup that you have? No, well, yes or no. I think the kind of the, the review request part thereof, um, we still recommend that same kind of, you know, two email sequence. Um, but where I think this becomes interesting is, um, again, like we're talking to, to your point about how valuable a good, about in cart um, your email sequences, um, we've seen, for example, being able to include reviews data in your abandoned cart emails um, is kind of has that kind of uplift in um, 
in conversion rate and recovery rate, right? So just something very simple, like either just showing at least the star rating for the products that were left in the cards um, or things that are now kind of interesting that we can now do is actually show the text that literally looks like customer testimonials um, from customers for those products that were abandoned, right? So I think those are the kind of interesting things to take the review data that you have collected already um, and start using it in all, in all of your different kind of your post-purchase email sequences or and or kind of your newsletters um, if you're so inclined. Because that definitely you know, kind of you know, seems to work. I mean, it's, it's definitely it's, it's early days yet for us in terms of this. We're still building a, a more extensive case study in terms of what definitely works, what works better than other things. Um, but we are seeing very encouraging kind of your signs where merchants are, are doing those things. So what you're, if I was to if I was to to work this out, then what you're basically saying is is that the review data, building the trust, is the most probably the most important data set that any any business owner has, and that what you're saying is is plant it sit, sitting inside all of the other email sequences that you have running, and it can add value in the long term. Yeah, totally. And you know what? The, the, the thing that most surprised me about this is there. There's a lot of data around kind of your know, product reviews, right? And why it helps convert. And like we, we're, as Convergio, we're not reinventing that wheel. Like we're, we've done nothing um, you know, innovative about product reviews in itself. The thing kind of the, where I, the thing I'm surprised about is the kind of the average store and the general store at this stage uses product reviews on their website, right? On their product pages, for example, and they've been doing that kind of for ages. That's the kind of tried and tested method. And we do that because we know that creates that trust. It is that social proof and health with convergence. So what I don't know, and I, I, I mean, I, I guess it's just because it has been technically hard to do, but that same, in theory, the same reasons why you would want to create that trust, use that social proof on your website, why would you not want to do that in your emails as well? Because your email is still, is still a significant kind of in terms of volume of kind of interactions you're having with your customers, right? So the same theory it applies there. If you're promoting a new product to, you know, to, to a customer, you want to create that, that trust, use that social proof to convince them in that email to buy that product that you're kind of promoting you know, in that email. So I think that's where kind of we're starting to kind of really, you know, kind of innovate and do more interesting things. Um, and again, like the, the, the almost um, shameless puns here for, for my side is part of, I think, why we're able to do that and why others aren't necessarily doing that is because we don't require some kind of integration to this. We support both those kind of, you know, sets of products in terms of emails um, and product reviews. You have everything in the, I suppose, in the, in, the, as in, in the one place. But I mean, at this, at the same time, I just noticed that you integrated with Smile, which is a wonderful loyalty platform. So integrations are obviously part of your, your growth strategy as well. So they are important, aren't they? Yeah, totally. And I mean, we. I'm not trying to to knock um, integrations, right? Um, and I'm not trying to suggest that we can. We would always rather build kind of a certain set of features or functionality ourselves. I think. Something like loyalty, for example, but it is a very specialist solution, and it would be very hard for us to kind of build something uniquely valuable to the ecosystem for there. So there are still integrations that we rely on. I just think that there are also kind of the the our mindset to this is that there are also things that we can do that are closer to each other. So so kind of from a technical standpoint, emails and product reviews were close to each other, close enough to each other for us to rather focus on having those two things natively um, than seek an external, you know, integration. Whereas yeah. with our, with yeah, our style integration, for example, like I am very, very passionate about it. We've, we've done some like awesome, awesome stuff, um, you know, around it. I'm actually developing a, a webinar at the moment, um, literally kind of teaching six kind of tactics like to how to improve customer loyalty in your rewards program um, with kind of simple email marketing Kind of automation tricks. So there's a lot that, that we've learned kind of there as well. Um, integrations like that will, will always be kind of you know important and, and on our radar as well. The feature I love with the Smile integration is the ability to the ability to, to send the customer you know their, their their current balance of loyalty rewards, which I, I think is just. I mean, as a merchant, if you're sending, you're basically sending money to the customer to say, look, do you realise you've got this balance on your account, which is uh, which is super. So well done on that. Now, Edie. Can you explain what uh, you're launching very, very soon in terms of, uh, is it a, a kind of a, an overarching summary of what you do or what, what is the, can you explain what the brand trust platform is? 
Yeah, so essentially what this is, Keith, is we, we've we been looking at, as we you know, kind of you know, focused on building these individual tools um, around product reviews and emails, working at that intersection, um, what we can do to help brands build more trust. And kind of taking a step back in terms of our motivation, I think what we've seen and what anyone in the e-car space will agree is that any kind of, or most marketplaces, you know, at least, are becoming massively saturated and highly competitive, right? Which means that it's, I think it's harder than ever before to stand out in the crowd, to, to be unique. And I think newer brands are finding it harder to find that those initial customers, existing brands are struggling to continue growing. Um, you know, companies are struggling to use kind of your, or at least in a cost efficient way, use, um, you know, paid acquisition via Facebook ads or Google AdWords. Um, all those things are becoming harder. So what we've been trying to kind of you know, think about is what does the future of kind of marketing and the future for e-commerce brands look like? And for us, the, the first thing that we wanted to do there was this, build this brand trust platform and build it based on kind of product reviews um, and user-generated content. So for us, that literally means kind of how can you involve more of your customers, that diverse set of customers that you have, um, and really help kind of empower them to kind of build your brand. Because um, we believe as a kind of team that the kind of the, the next wave of really successful and really great e-commerce brands um, are going to focus on their customer relationships. Uh, and that sounds like, like something that everyone should be doing already. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I think kind of the, the, the real relationships will, will focus on kindness, they will focus on trust, um, diversity, inclusion, all those things that I don't think brands necessarily do now. I think the, the interactions that those brands have with their, their customers will be kinder, they'll be smarter. I think when I think about sending emails, it will be about sending less emails and trying to kind of, but still trying to help the customer get what they want, like add value to their lives, their agenda. So I think those are the kinds of ideas that we're playing around. Um, and the kind of brand trust platform I said is, is just the first, our first step um, into building this greater platform to facilitate those kinds of relationships and help e-commerce businesses build those brands that will make them kind of defensible um, and kind of thriving in, in the future. You're, you're probably ahead of the curve there because 50% of the stores that we go into don't even have reviews switched on. So, I mean, you're like, you're, it, it will, it will, the, you know, the cost of, of, the, of pay-per-click advertising is growing in some cases of, at 50% a year. So, you, you know, you, your, your relationship with the customer has to be much deeper than just taking their credit card details and sending them a box. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that grows and, and I'll be interested to see, you know, the details of it when it launches. Um, just, just, I suppose just to finish, AD, you know, are you excited about the next couple of years? Have you, you know, have you got a nice roadmap of, of really exciting features that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, we, um, so my team and I are um, leaving for, for Zanzibar on our uh, kind of, you know, biannual team retreat uh, very soon. And, and one of the big points to discuss there is to, to plan out kind of our, you know, our, our roadmap. Um, we have some good stuff um, lined up at least for kind of, you know, the next six months. Um, some of the things are already in, uh, in kind of beta phase. Um, so there, there's definitely some excitement there. Um, and as I said, I, I think, those, when I speak, when you ask me about the brand trust platform, I think those kind of same ideas and ideology, uh, ideologies um, and beliefs are things that kind of fuels you know, me and you know, me and my team. Um, we really want to kind of you know, make Converger the kind of company that inspires everyone within the ecosystem to think differently about kind of not only just building the business, but how building that business relates to kind of the life they live. So we, we've gone out there and said, we are first and foremost, uh, you know, a family and life first company. Um, and I think it's, it's that kind of, you know, paradigm shift, that thought leadership that's, you know, keeps us excited, keeps us passionate. Um, and Converger as a product then almost becomes a kind of a vehicle for us to hopefully, you know, just have the opportunity to have conversations like this, where we can share, uh, share these beliefs uh, and hopefully inspire others to, to kind of, you know, build on, on top of the work that we do.
AD, that's great. I um, have to say, I'm looking forward to, to watching the release of the Plan Trust platform. And uh, look, at we'll continue to install your app on as many stores as possible. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Keith, and thanks for all the support. Thanks for listening to episode four of the Milk Bottle Shopify e-commerce podcast with AD Panair of Conversio. Until next time, take care.